welcome to the 5:30 January 26, 2021 Titusville City Council meeting. We do have a quorum, so I will call this meeting to order. Would you please join me in a moment of silence? And the Pledge of Allegiance. This is a um, meeting of presentations, so City Manager, would you please introduce the special recognitions and presentations? Sure. For the first agenda item 4A, we'd like to recognize the Employee of the Month for September 2020, which is Ms. Lori Dargi. And uh, Ms. Misaka, I think, is going to des describe um, um, her activity. She was unable to attend the January meeting, so that's why you're, you're seeing it today. Um, Mayor Diesel, could I s interrupt? I'm sorry. Um, Stan Johnston asks that we recognize his email that he submitted. He says that it's on each agenda item for the 530 meeting, so I just want that to be recognized. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Stan, just for my benefit, you sent that earlier today? Yes, okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Unlike most of the times that I'm speaking to you tonight, I'm really excited about it. Um, wow. <laughs> Bang, start things off. Yeah, I know. Um, I gave blood today, so, yeah. But um, the reason I'm so excited is because I get to introduce to you Lori Dargi. In my opinion, one of the most difficult duties that we ask anyone here at the city to do is to complete minutes of board meetings. They are expected to understand the issues well enough to include the most pertinent points of discussion, listening for meaning as well as content. They're also expected to provide this information in a readable and organized format, often being asked to interpret poor recordings, people speaking over each other or just forgetting to turn on their mics. Lori Dargi is the person who, after she is at the planning and zoning and TEC meetings for several hours, gets up the next day and is able to provide you the minutes the very next day. That is, makes her, in my opinion, an exceptional employee, and I'm happy to introduce her to you. Mayor, if you could come. Thank you. That's very awesome. I love to start things off with a, a positive. So we move on to the next presentation. Yes, sir. The next presentation is uh, by our support services department. They will provide ca council a departmental presentation. Uh, no action is required. Mr. Tom Bata, assistant city manager, will uh, be providing you the presentation. Evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council, Tom Abate, assistant city manager. It's my pleasure to give you a brief overview of the support services department. It consists of seven different teams and seven different departments and divisions. We like to consider ourselves the engine that keeps the city of Titusville staff on track. We uh, oversee all the support services, centralized services, such as IT, HR, finance, customer service, purchasing and contracting. And we have a number of our folks here tonight. Um, some of them are very familiar faces. We have Bridget Clemens, our uh, finance director. Terry Chevalier is our finance manager. She does our budget. Let's see who else. Um, Joe Dinero is our HR director. April Chapman is our purchasing and contracting 
uh, director, and behind this, the uh, booth there is Jim Thomas, and he runs our community relations and media services. <coughs> yeah. oh. He's back there somewhere. Um, what I'd like to do today is show you a, a uh, short video that gives you an overview of the accomplishments and the highlights of the past year. This is going to be the first in every month we'll, we'll provide you a, another presentation of another department in the city. So we'd kick it off with the, the most important department. <laughs> The Support Services Department is a combination of eight unique work centers which provide support for the other city departments. The Support Services Department is overseen by Assistant City Manager Tom Abate, who provides oversight to the department and its subordinate divisions and aids City Manager Scott Larice in the performance of a variety of general administrative tasks and special projects, including the city's strategic planning, budget, and agenda preparation efforts. Community Relations is responsible for the city's outreach with its citizens, including audiovisual, print, web, and social media production. Our staff produces a multitude of public service announcements and video projects each year. We also provide technical support for special events, city training, and provide graphic concepts and designs for a wide variety of projects. Every year, we produce as many as 80 live city government meetings that are broadcast live throughout Central Florida on Spectrum Channel 498 and AT&T UVerse Channel 99, and streamed live on YouTube. Titusville Talking Points magazine and accompanying video continues to be very popular, featuring articles discussing the latest and greatest information on construction, local events, general information, and economic development. Our department designs and maintains the overall appearance and navigation of the city's website and provides oversight and assistance to the city's departments for their respective web pages. We are also responsible for posting regular news items and promotional material for the city-related events. Over the past year, we reviewed hundreds of websites and completely redesigned our website along with thousands of pages within. As a part of our community outreach, we oversee the city's LED signs, Facebook, and YouTube channel, Instagram, and Twitter. Community Advocate also responds to web-based inquiries, phone, and walk-in complaints. Community Relations is a member of the Titusville Area Visitors Council, Visit Florida, the Florida Public Relations Association, Public Information Network, enhancing professional development and building promotional and professional partnerships within the community. We also made great strides with producing ADA content, which allows the visually impaired user the ability to utilize website and documents such as the annual budget. The Customer Service and Utility Billing Division consists of 17 employees handling all of the billing and payment transactions for utilities and other services provided by the City Departments. These employees include cashiers, customer service specialist, a customer service coordinator, a utility billing specialist, a utility billing coordinator, a collections specialist, a field services supervisor, field services representatives, clerical assistants, and a manager serving over 21,000 customers. In the past year, the department processed approximately 197,000 payment transactions and 56,000 online and automated phone payments. We also processed approximately 1,600 cutoffs, 24,000 work orders, and we fielded 54,000 phone calls and served 12,500 walk-in customers. Our department handles customer utility billing questions. We handle utility service requests and issue temporary service turn-on, turn-off orders. Last year, our collection specialist processed over 16,500 delinquency notices as a service to help citizens keep their accounts current. The field services section handles utility reconnects, water meter rereads, water meter tampering inspections, and data logs. Last year, there were approximately 154 utility tampering cases reported. The Customer Service and Utility Billing Division recently converted to a new billing system and payment processor. Invoice Cloud, our new payment processor, provides additional payment options for customers when paying online and over IVR system by allowing EFT check payments along with credit card payments. They also provide pay by tech service for our customers. 
The purpose of the Finance Department is to safeguard the assets and manage the financial affairs of the city, including revenue collection, real estate, cash disbursement, accounting and financial reporting investment, and debt management. Our job is to provide timely advice to the city management and elected officials on issues affecting the current and future financial affairs of the city using generally accepted government accounting principles. Other important functions of the department include, but not limited to, overseeing the process of liens and estoppels, employee payroll, accounts payable, and compiling the 116 million annual budget. Our department also processes the biweekly payroll, which totals 24 million annually, and accounts payable checks totaling over 34 million. For 36 years running, the city's finance department received the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting from the Government Finance Officers Association for exceeding the generally accepted accounting principles in our annual financial reports. The finance department is continually striving to improve their processes and achieve better efficiency. We've streamlined the budgeting process and electronic payroll processing, enhanced financial reporting tools, and implemented new financial software. We are currently in the process of implementing this new software, along with completing the payroll processing transition and automating the reporting functions. The Human Resources Team provides a full suite of HR services for a workforce of approximately 530 full-time equivalent members. These services include Human Resource Information Systems Management, Employee Health Center, Healthcare Benefits for Active Employees, Dependents and Retirees who are Pre-Medicare and Medicare Eligible and Wellness Services, Employee Assistant Program Services, Workers' Compensation and Risk Management, Training union contract negotiations, pay and compensation, retirement, staffing, employee onboarding and employee recognition, internships, and summer youth program coordination. We also strive to attract, motivate, and retain highly qualified, service-oriented employees whose diversity and skills contribute to and sustain a quality organization. In 2019, the Human Resources Team worked to implement a dual option health plan for team members active and retired. The dual option offers a value plan with a higher deductible and lower premium for employees looking to make health care costs more affordable and an enhanced plan option with lower deductible and higher premium costs offering a more generous health care benefit for our members. Because maintaining a healthy workforce is of paramount importance. The HR team continues its partnership with Parish Medical Center to bring off-site clinic services to the city's employees, dependents, and retirees. And because of our commitment to creating a healthier workplace, the City of Titusville earned a Bronze Level Aetna Workplace Wellbeing Inspiring Change Award for 2020. In fiscal year 2020, the HR team prepared a pay schedule proposal with a desire to improve recruitment and employee retention by seeking to align employee compensation with similar positions found in other organizations and municipalities. In fiscal year 2021, the HR team looks forward to implementing the pay plan study. Our team properly identifies and reduces risk exposure through a variety of initiatives. The Information Technology Department is responsible for the citywide network and all attached devices. Using fiber optics, the overall wide area network connects 19 city buildings located throughout the city, each with their own local networks. The department manages the city's software services, including the 911 dispatch system, the city's financial management system, community development and code enforcement systems, fleet and fuel management, water billing and collection, work order management for public works, facilities and water resources, a variety of public safety systems for the police and fire departments, as well as email systems and a variety of file and print services. Notable achievements for 2020 include a new financial management system that handles transactions for most of the city's non-public safety agencies. We also upgraded the city's 911 dispatch system to the latest release of the software which provides opportunities to work more closely with Brevard County Sheriff's Office and improves information flow to first responders. We implemented the very latest in server technology which will provide the city with extremely high system availability. 
And we implemented a new backup system that brings all city agencies under a single system, ensuring data recovery for up to six months in case of loss, and improves the city's ability to recover from malicious ransomware attacks. Last year, our help desk team resolved 2,485 requests for help from our city employees through our ticketing system. Almost 86% were resolved within two hours without having to dispatch a technician. Located just north of City Hall, the Titusville Marina is a full-service marina managed by F3 Management Company. The marina boasts over 200 slips and mooring opportunities for daily and monthly renters, as well as a boater's indoor and outdoor lounge. Some of the marina's other amenities include newly renovated restrooms, Wi-Fi, pump-out service, security gates, and a boater's gift shop. General Manager Tom Lawson reports that the marina is open year-round and averages 94 to 100 percent occupancy rate during the busy season. The Purchasing and Contract Division provides procurement services to user departments in order to promote the effective, efficient, and economical purchase of all supplies and services ensuring the city maximizes its return and complies with legal purchasing requirements. The Purchasing and Contracts Division's primary responsibility is for the contract administration and the acquisition of goods and services that are essential to citywide operations. We are responsible for the annual procurement of approximately $36.6 million worth of goods and services, annual contracts, construction projects, and professional service agreements. The department made over $3 million in purchases from local vendors in the city over the past 12 months. The department administers the city's purchase card program made up of over 160 users. Some of our department's major purchasing projects include marina fuel dispenser replacement, ERP software and implementation, wash rack improvements, cross-connection device testing, ion chromatographer, two-inch waterline replacement, septic and sewer conversion, slip lining rehabilitation, Osprey 2 effluent pumps, mobile radios for PD, and marine lift station improvements. In physical year 19 through 20, our department achieved over 17% savings from smart bidding practices and oversaw the disposition of surplus assets exceeding over $37,000. The Special Projects Grants Division is responsible for helping city departments and divisions obtain grant funding to help offset the cost of eligible programs. This department has also assisted with coordinating the annual fireworks show for Independence Day celebrations. Overall, the Single Person Work Center wears many hats, such as Lean Six Sigma Coordinator, Emergency Management, Derelict Vessel Removal, Strategic Planning and Performance Measures, various project coordination, grant research, special events administration, Pritchard House liaison, administrative policy coordination. One important role stood out in the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian, where the special projects coordinator was able to procure over $75,000 of federal funds for the city. They also worked with the CARES Act and have received over $255,000 throughout the COVID pandemic, with more to come. see uh, a lot of moving parts within support services and we have a blessed to have a really dedicated staff of 53 full-time and part-time individuals with that I'd be happy to answer any questions oh I just want to start off by saying first of all I'm glad there's not a quiz to follow because, <laughs> because you know, I started writing a few numbers down early and then they just kept coming uh, one that hit me pretty quick was 54,000 phone calls I believe that was just in the water department Yes. I mean, and that's just really one. Busy. I mean, just the, the volume of the things you do. Um, and I also wanted to add, and again, I'm glad you showed that because I, I will tell you, I don't think I knew how much, how many, uh, how many different departments came under support services. So I'm very impressed. Uh, but one of the things early in the video I saw and I wanted to comment on was uh, the TV production that we do here, that you all do. When you go to those channels, if you flip around a little bit, I don't care what other entity it is, it's not as good as ours. Absolutely. Uh, and and I'm, I, I guess everybody's saying, yeah, you're supposed to say that. But, uh, but in reality, it, go to the channels. 
I mean, I'm not going to call it any city or county or anything like that. I'm just going to tell you that ours is, is the best, the tightest of talking points, the talking points video. Um, it's just a very professional, well done group. And then again, I don't want to forget anybody because you had so many, but I'm just, uh, it seems like you guys have everybody in the support services. So congratulations on a job well done. Thank you. Very, very proud of you guys. Thank you. Uh, Member Jordan. Yeah. I, I, where are you going? Come on, man. You don't hear what I got to say? <laughs> I didn't miss it. He didn't didn't miss it. Yeah, he left for sure. Um, Tom, I just want you to uh, relate to uh, all your employees how appreciative we are of uh, their dedicated work uh, that they do uh, for the city. It's, it's kind of easy for those on the outside to complain about things, but uh, every experience I've had with all the employees, they already had, always had a positive attitude and a can-do attitude. And so it is very much appreciated on my part, and I'm sure specifically on council's part, uh, that they understand that we are very appreciative of all the work that they do, uh, and it hasn't gone, uh, gone unnoticed. Um, this presentation was excellent wow. in my mind because it actually shows uh, everything that they do, uh, and they do it with excellence. So thank you so much, okay? Thank you for those kind words. I'll be sure to pass them along to the team. Absolutely. I, I by the way, I'm more than happy to say we put the county to shame as far as our media relations. You have relations <laughs> over there, I think. <laughs> and, um, and uh, Mayor, one point that I would like to make is uh, this particular group during uh, none of us have ever been through a global pandemic and uh, they didn't miss a beat, um, continued to provide the services that that uh, they do so well, uh, even under some pretty uh, scary circumstances for, for some. So um, again, I, I think um, this year has been a trying year on our staff, but I think they came through and, and shine color. I, I, I'd like to joke around a little bit with them that who in the world would ever bring a mainframe software upgrade on during a global pandemic? And they did it with grace, and it, Unbelievable. It's, it's, it's perfect. Well, as said, we appreciate you very much. Please pass that on, and thank you. City Manager, we move to C. Yes, sir. Item C is the Community Development Department will provide a presentation on the draft 2040 comprehensive plan. No actions required. It'll be Mr. Brad Parrish for this presentation. Good evening. Good evening. Um, let's see. So this project started back in 2017. Um, if you, some of you remember back in 2017, the state required us to go through what's called the evaluation and appraisal process, report process. And that's basically a, every seven years we're supposed to update our comprehensive plan. And if you're not familiar with that, what that is, that's our growth management document. We're not supposed to do anything inconsistent with that comprehensive plan. So any rezonings that comes before you, changes to our land development regulations have to be consistent with that plan. So we did what the state uh, required us to do back in 2017. Uh, we adopted our ear amendments back in 2018 and we were done. However, um, oh, and we also included uh, sea level rise policies. That was a big issue at that time. And we, um, after that, we adopted a resiliency strategic plan as a, as a result of that. At the same time though, the city council gave the staff direction to go forward with a visioning exercise with the public to consider additional amendments to the comprehensive plan. And in, 2000, in the fall of 2017, with the help of a consultant, we worked with Canaan Associates to work with the public, um, and they held three workshops here in this room to come up with a new vision document, which was eventually brought to you to the council in January 2018, which was adopted, that included three main strategies going forward. And those three were refocus our energy on a bigger and expanded downtown area, a look at our commercial corridors, um, primarily Garden Street, Cheney, and US-1, and see, look at ways to revitalize those areas and encourage redevelopment of those areas. And then thirdly, uh, really focus on the waterfront and tie the city into that asset, which uh, the consultant identified as, as a really underutilized asset for the city. So those are the three things that came out of that vision document. <coughs> Afterwards, uh, we worked with the consultant to come up with new changes to the comprehensive plan, and we decided to go forward with a complete rewrite. So we wrote, rewrote the whole comp plan in 2018, brought it sections of it to you, 
um, to the council and to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, in 2019, we held several um, workshops with the Planning and Zoning Commission because they had a lot of in-depth questions. Finally, in, in, on September 2nd, 2020, they recommended approval of the plan to be forwarded over to you for recommendation to get it transmitted to the state for review. And what that means is if you agree to transmit this plan with the changes that are redlined and strike through in here, uh, with in addition to some additional comments and requests by the Planning and Zoning Commission and any other changes you'd like to see, it would be transmitted to state for review to find out whether we're on the, on the right track, basically. It doesn't require us to adopt it. It just says that we'll get comments back from them. And then we have a certain amount of time to act on them. So after we receive comments from the state, you do not have to go forward with the plan. You can let it die or go or come change it and or send it back to them again. Um, but you could adopt it if you are satisfied with it after you receive comments from the state. So that's what the commission basically recommended. I do have a, a presentation that'll take about 15 minutes to go through. Um, I can answer questions during or after, however you like. Brad, I, I read that document pretty closely. And it was um, the should and the shells in the policies and, and so forth. And it uh, concerned me that when it gets to the corridor off of uh, 405, some places or miss, and it uses the word should a lot instead of shall. And in the law world, I found out that there's a lot of difference between those two words. And I wonder, are we putting, I was just got a report of some incidents over in that area off of 405. And I wonder, are we putting enough emphasis in that area when we put these plans together? Are we right there in part of that plan um, it says from, with the exception of Rock Pit to another street. You, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So my concerns is that we need to put some, take the should out and put some shells in for that area. Okay. Vice Mayor. Uh, Mr. Robin said, is there a specific, um, page you're looking at going, this should be shall as opposed to should? Uh, well, he knows what I'm doing here. You yeah. know. Some, of the, some of the areas um, are, are designated like uh, the Rock Pit Road to, I don't from one street to the next, with the exception of that area. Okay. 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 That terminology is in there. And, um, and I just want to um, see if we can tighten that up because being in the um, nonprofit business mm -hmm. for the last 24 years here in Titusville, I have seen a lot of things written up about an area for improvement. And every year or every five years, uh, we go back and change some of the adjectives and the verbs, okay. but to make it look like a new document. And I just want to see some of those shells brought on. You want to see action? I want to see action okay. on that. Got it. Ms. Parrish, you got any comment on that? Or are you aware of what he's speaking to? I believe you're referring to some, we proposed neighborhood policies uh, related to multifamily development in, um, along Rockbrook Road. There, that, is a, that is a policy that's specifically in our current comprehensive plan. Uh, we carried it over to this new one at the request of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, the question is, how flexible do you want to be or how stringent do you want to be? And so it always comes down to whether you should say shall or should you say should or encourage. Um, so it's really how you'd like to see it. The commission was concerned about multifamily adjacent to single family. They were very concerned about the impacts to especially existing single family neighborhoods. So there were a lot of questions about that, a lot of answers we gave them as far as transitional language, new language we put in there. Uh, but we are open to any recommendations you have. What uh, is the concern uh, about, and I think I kind of got it with the word flexibility, and maybe that's what it is. What's the concern about inserting shall for should? I, 
So if you say shall, you're saying that it has to happen that way. That's how we have to uh, enforce it. If you say, sh say should, then typically uh, depends then how we would draft the land development regulations to implement that particular policy or program, whatever that might be, uh, to help implement that policy. And that could be tailored based on how we th would like to enforce that policy, whether we want to be stringent about it or not. But when it says shall, you, you must enforce it the way it's stated here in this, co in this comprehensive plan. Okay. And you're going to move forward here? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I do want to point to you on, a, on your packet on page um, 15 of your packet. You'll see just the, con the table of contents of the comprehensive plan. I'm not going to go through this in detail. I just want to point you to that page because that gives you an outline of the comprehensive plan as we've drafted it. This is a complete restructuring of what you have now. The comprehensive plan is supposed to have 11 elements or chapters, if you will, and we've restructured all that completely. Uh, we, took, we took that whole typical way of doing comprehensive plans in Florida out the window and adopted some newer versions that we found in Florida. So this is something that has been tried and done in Florida, and we think it would be appropriate and would work here in Titusville. So the first half of this plan, you'll see, is all about places and land use. So the focus is on transportation, land use and those two are really intertwined with each other. The rest of it, the, the second half, you'll see housing, natural resources, and public facilities. So I'll, I'll briefly describe what that is in my presentation. On page 11 and 12 of your packet, um, basically outlines the key issues that we found with the current comprehensive plan versus our approach and that's on page 12. And one of the things that we found was that we we're going to see a population increase in the next 20 years. Based on our historic growth rate of about 1%, we we're estimating an increase above that, but just below what the University of Florida projects for us. And that will result in a population of about 66,000 plus by the year 2040. And so based on that, we need to figure out where we're going to put these people. And the typical growth pattern we see in Titusville is building in vacant lands, which are primarily what's left are marginal lands, the ones that are hard to build on, those ones that have environmental issues. But we have a lot of opportunity on properties that are in our commercial quarters and in our urban core that could definitely be revitalized and redeveloped to allow for an increased density. And so we looked at um, some of the issues with the current comprehensive, comprehensive plan and the code. And, and another thing we found was that we see a lot of exclusionary zoning or exclusionary land use categories. So it forces the developer to come to you to ask, can I change this commercially land uh, zoned or property that has a commercial land use on it to a residential? Or can I do a mix? And they have no option but to come before you and go through some kind of legislative process to get your permission to do that. What we're proposing is that this comprehensive plan will add mixed use land use categories as opposed to these exclusionary land use categories which are binary between commercial or residential but will allow both as a by right but the caveat is that you would need to come up with some revisions to your land development regulations some urban design standards to help accommodate those types of mixed use developments retail vacancy we have an inordinate amount of commercial land commercially zoned land that's vacant and even that that is built the buildings are vacant. So we have an overabundance of retail land use categories. Uh, we definitely have a huge, a very high parking requirement compared to other communities, especially in Brevard. In fact, in Brevard, we had the highest. And setback standards are pretty stringent as well. Um, and, land, and buffering requirements. One of the, the uh, problems with this strategy that we have with our current comprehensive plan is it does create this typical land pattern you see right now in Orange County, for example, where you see these single-use subdivisions or single-use zoning districts where you walk out your front door and get into a car, you want to go to your neighbor behind you, you're going to have to drive, in this, this example, seven miles to get to their front door through a bunch of security streets that do, with subdivisions that do not connect with each other. So subdivisions and developments that have dead-end streets are, incur are discouraged with the, with the current new comprehensive plan. Creating connections, creating uh, blocks, short blocks, creating pedestrian pathways between developments is encouraged with this new comprehensive plan. 
The development pattern you see on the lower half of this sh sheet here is what our current comprehensive plan really encourages, or allows, rather. And that's where you see a lot of these dead-end street type of developments or strip center type developments dumping out onto one major street, which requires then increasing capacity on those streets to accommodate that new development. Whereas if you see on the, the top half of this image, you'll see a, a more gridded type development pattern, which disperses traffic, which doesn't require a dumping of all new development and residential uh, multifamily development, for example, onto the major streets. So that type of development pattern can accommodate and increase um, density and uh, floor area ratio. These are images that we've incorporated into the new comprehensive plan um, that illustrate the development patterns we see currently in Titusville. So the first one on the left you'll see is a typical suburban style type development pattern. And this is in the north part of our city. And you can see dead end streets with developments dumping out onto a major street. What you see on the right side, uh, this is a existing core that we have or develop older um, pattern or um, area of our city that has a development pattern that is conducive for increased residential development. F dot has been coming up with, it came up with uh, classifications uh, related to this uh, several years ago and they are now classifying all segments of their streets based on this classification system. And so you see a street segment that they maintain that has a development pattern that you see on the left side which is considered, which they would consider a suburban commercial, is your typical suburban retail with uh, single-use districts. That's only going to be able to accommodate certain types of improvements on that segment of that roadway when they plan to do any improvements there. The one on the right will uh, accommodate different types of improvements with FDOT. So for example, um, on an urban or downtown type center uh, segment of a street that has this uh, urban center or urban general classification, when they do their improvements or planning the later, they see the local jurisdiction's plans. That will help inform the decisions as to what type of improvements to put on those streets. So it's important that we consider what kind of urban design standards we'd like to see along our commercial corridors to help uh, that conversation with FDOT with the kind of improvements we'd like to see on the streets eventually. And that's consistent with a complete streets policy that we currently have in our comprehensive plan and that we've also added in the comprehensive plan. We've expanded on that some more with some more policies. We believe this uh, draft comprehensive plan is consistent with the Space Coast Trans Transportation Planning Organization's vision document. Uh, the city's economic development strategic plan that was adopted in 2017. Uh, the, the city's CRA downtown master plan and several other small area plans that the city has adopted over the years, including the waterfront plan. The, the consultant really harped on this idea of placemaking. And what you're trying to do is create a city and create a development pattern that is really memorable. And if you create a development pattern that is more strip center type development, I mean, that's kind of anywhere USA, it's not very memorable. You want to create something that's a destination people want to come to your city for. So the policies that they recommended help promote placemaking. And we've incorporated those policies throughout the comprehensive plan. Uh, one of the major changes we're proposing is a expanded downtown land use category that includes the neighborhood immediately to the west of the CRA. And you can see why it, the, the consultant recommended that because um, that original development pattern is really conducive to the type of uh, housing and mixed-use development that the consultant was, was recommending. The consultant also recommended um, generalized land use categories for the commercial quarter, such as Garden Street and on Cheney, and that would encourage uh, mixed-use type development. Again, the caveat is you've got to have good land development regulations for the development standards in there in your code. So the first step would be, if we adopt this comprehensive plan, those policies, the next step would be uh, city staff working on policy, how to implement those policies by changes to the code. So we'd come back to you with that. Another major change that we did was to consolidate several of the existing land use categories into about eight or nine categories. And these are generalized mixed use categories. Just so you understand, a land use category is supposed to be a holding category. It's not supposed to operate like a Euclidean zoning that we currently have in our code. 
with these exclusionary zoning districts. And that's the concept we're trying to propose here. In the expanded downtown land use category, you see several existing categories right now, such as our urban mixed use land use category, our commercials, or some of the residential land use categories consolidated into this bigger downtown category. Uh, we've introduced a uh, maximum allowable density map that freezes uh, residential density primarily throughout the city. So a sub, uh, sub, an existing subdivision that had a maximum density allowance of five units per acre is, is frozen. We're not changing. This adopting, adoption of this comprehensive plan doesn't automatically increase density throughout the city. Uh, the, we currently have this pr uh, tool in place in our code, but we've expanded some of the policies in the comp plan to uh, allow us to go forward and tailor this a little bit more, or fine tune it rather. Um, we do have a direction from the council from last year to go forward with changes to our open space definitions. We would like to incorporate that into our um, clustering rec uh, requirements in our code. And this is where a developer has the ability to maintain the density yield on a particular piece of property of residential units, but just keep allow them to have small lots and thereby encouraging that developer to uh, save open space. That's a current tool we have. We, the policies allow us to come back to you with some additional changes. Um, another major change is to consolidate several of our industrial and commercial land use categories into a research and manufacturing land use category. And this will be primarily beneficial in the area south of 405, um, or around the airport. Uh, that could be, that whole area could be tailored as one giant uh, research and manufacturing district, kind of like innovation di uh, zone or over in Orange County. Uh, it doesn't require, right now we just a plethora of different land use categories for primarily the same thing, for the airport, industrial uses, commercial uses. Uh, this is just an illustration of how the new comprehensive plan would look compared to the, uh, map rather would look compared to the old. It would just look a lot cleaner and would illustrate those big generalized categories. And so this is what the new comprehensive plan map or future land use map would look. Uh, we've replaced the transportation element of the comprehensive plan with a mobility element. And so instead of just focusing on roadway capacity, it now addresses um, trails, uh, transportation, uh, transit infrastructure, uh, bicycle, on-street bicycle network, uh, uh, sidewalks. All of that is important now, instead of just roadway capacity. Uh, we did um, add, we did not change anything regardless of classification of what is an arterial collector street and the level of service of those, although we tried. We thought that was, we could make adjustments to those, but the Planning and Zoning Commission did not agree with that. Uh, we added new multimodal policies. We added additional complete streets policies, and we added block perimeter policies. So that means that in certain areas where you have that block perimeter development pattern, like I showed you earlier in a previous slide, we'd want to have policies to help preserve that instead of consolidating those into super blocks. And we've added policies related to access management. So that would ask the staff to go forward with coming up with new uh, criteria in the code related to access management. So where driveways to individual uh, lots would be located. Um, that's important for safety. Another thing we were about the, what we did uh, was to amend the housing element of the comprehensive plan to include additional policies related to affordable housing. We encouraging uh, preservation and reuse of historic homes and establish preferred housing topologies. As you can see in this illustration here, there's really two types of residential development that continues to come down the pipeline, and that is high-rise apartments or low-rise single-family subdivisions. And it's that missing middle that never seems to appear, or at least some our code doesn't really encourage. And so we'd like to see, maybe looking at our code to see if we can encourage a mixture of different types of housing in neighborhoods. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean putting a, a duplex in, in the middle of a single family neighborhood. What that means is there are areas in the city that could accommodate different types of housing mixed in within the same area. 
in a new development pattern. Uh, we have that in Lacita right now and even par other parts of the city where there is a mixture of quads right next to a single family, right next to a townhome development, and it works. We've carried over the existing open space and environmental policies from the existing comp plan to this new one. Uh, we made some tweaks to it. The major changes were really from the Planning and Zoning Commission. They found that the staff had omitted several policies and they've asked us to carry them over. Uh, one significant policy that was carried over is one related to the conservation land use. This is a big uh, issue for the Planning and Zoning Commission. Is This is a policy that currently states that if you identify a wetland that's five acres or more on your property through a comprehensive plan or, land, or rezoning change, then you must put that into this conservation land use category. That has not changed. We haven't made any changes to that policy. Um, and so... Now I'm going to go into the rest of the comprehensive plan, the second half, and that's all the elements, the rest of the elements about infrastructure. So again, mobility, that's the transportation portion. Uh, water, sewer, stormwater, solid waste, and schools are all addressed in different sections of this comp plan. An additional, uh, one uh, other uh, element of the current comp plan that was carried over to the new is the capital improvements element. And Every year, we are supposed to update, adopt a, uh, a schedule, a five-year capital improvement schedule, amending the five-year capital improvements for concurrency-related facilities that are identified and addressed inside the comprehensive plan. That has not changed. We just carry that over to this new plan. That's a state policy. We're required to bring that to you and have that adopted by December 1st every year. It's not a comprehensive plan amendment when it comes before you. It's just an, uh, an, a, an update. But that has to address those level of service standards that we've established inside each of these sections here. For example, there may be a level of service standard for parks. Right now is we have to provide a thousand, um, I think it's a eight for eight acres per thousand people is what the level of service standard is. We're, well, we're meeting that well above that, so there's not a problem right now. But that's a level of service standard. And if we are deficient in that, we have to include a project inside that schedule and bring it to you at the end of the year. We've included a new uh, level of service standard for parks, and that is any new residential development that is not located within walking distance of a quarter mile of an existing park would need to create a park, maybe part of their development. We don't have that as part of our, uh, our code right now, and that's something we would introduce if this policy is adopted. Uh, we just carried over our same uh, regulate our policies from the intergovernmental element of our current pl comp plan to the new with some changes that were minor. But basically, it, it addresses how we coordinate with the county and other agencies in providing our services. So the key strategies of this new plan is to introduce new development and design standards with the mixed-use land use categories, uh, a brand-new multimodal master plan. We've got one adopted for trails, um, and we did that, I believe, last year. That's just the first step. We'd like to come back to you with additional multimodal master plans as well that address other transportation-related facilities. Uh, the plan also recommends uh, doing a recreation and open space master plan. We already completed the resiliency strategic plan, and we would. the plan also asks us to update the waterfront master plan. That was a specific recommendation from the consultant. And we would also do neighborhood plans. Uh, some of you are familiar with small area plans. We do those in some parts of the city, but the new plan, comprehensive plan would ask us to do individual neighborhood plans around the city to address whether we have the appropriate land uses and zoning districts in those areas or infrastructure. We did have a, a very complex adoption strategy that was outlined in the new plan. We're eliminating that. What we're going to recommend to you is uh, three alternatives at the end of my presentation. I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. We made several changes since the last time the this was presented to the council in 2019, and basically at the request of the Planning and Zoning Commission, we added language related to transitions between single family uses and other uses. We revised environmental policies related to the Indian River Lagoon. We've added a policy or a statement related to um, implementing the BMAP. 
but we've added canopy policies that we adopted carried over from Tampa. Uh, we've also uh, clarified some clearing policies and updated the wetland policies based on the, on the commission's request. Uh, again, we have that allowable density map for residential areas. Um, and we've added a reference to the U.S. quarter one master plan um, as, as it's written. I think it's, it's already referenced and adopted by reference in the new current plan, and we're carrying that over to the new. And again, we revised the uh, transportation policies. We've also addressed policies related to the area of critical concern and reclaimed water. And that was at the request of the commission as well. Um, as far as going forward, I'd like to just recommend to you three ways or alter alternatives that you can consider at your regular meeting. And that is, uh, one, you could not do anything. and We just continue going forward with the current comp plan as we have right now. Um, the second option would be to go forward with this, with the changes that you recommend and or with this, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended and send it to the, state, to the state for their review to see what they say about this. Uh, when it comes back again, you can consider whether to adopt it or make additional changes. The third option is to um, break it up. And we would come back, we can come back to you with a strategy or a proposal of what that, would, what that means. The idea would be to take certain sections out of this draft plan and propose to you what we could, what we think would be appropriate to incorporate into the current plan. For example, the mobility section here could replace our transportation element very easily. Um, other sections of this draft document could be taken out and maybe carried over into the land development regulations as new development standards or an overlay, a zoning overlay, or whatever that might be. We can come back to you with those proposals. So if option two or alternative two is not acceptable, then we can come back to you with, with a proposal of how we can break up this document and maybe implement it or incorporate it into our existing documents. So that I'll try and answer any questions you have. Um, hold on there, Member Jordan. Real quick, I've just got one that stands out for me on uh, slide 25, uh, the parks. I believe that's the parks. Yes, yeah, new parks, level of service based on proximity to residential. I remember that being a big discussion last time. Obviously, I like the parks. I like them within a quarter mile. Um, who's responsible? It, it looks like the developers are responsible for making sure there's a park. Who's responsible for maintaining the parks? Mayor, um, th this, this is the presentation meeting. And this will actually be an agenda item at your 630 meeting. And we've asked for um, council direction at that agenda item at 630. Okay, by that you mean we're <laughs> going to give you advice on that? Yeah, yes, sir. You, you, what, what, during the presentation meeting, we, we will provide you the presentation with no action required. And then at your 630 meeting, the, the comprehensive plan will come back to you for further discussion and guidance to staff. Okay, so maybe he shouldn't ask for questions. Is that what you're saying? I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. Am I wrong? Yeah. <laughs> so I've got, well, I see y'all left. Those yes. All kinds of buttons were going, now they're gone. Yeah, yes, sir. Okay, so just understand, we will ask these questions at the next meeting. Yes, sir. Remember that question. Okay, um, and I guess we say thank you for your presentation. And I, it was well done. I, I, I like a lot of what I see. I have some questions, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Interesting. I kind of swore he said, any questions? It, <laughs> and, All right, uh, we move on. Yes, sir. Uh, moving manager. on, um, item 4D is the FY21 first quarter financial review. Um, Bridget Clements is here to provide that to you. The, we normally don't do a first quarter review for council. Uh, we have normally done that during mid-year, but because of the state revenues, um, keeping an uh, eye on state revenues and other revenues that may be taking a hit because of the COVID, we thought we would come back to you every quarter until we get through this crisis. Okay, y'all ready? If I can make this work. Okay. Did you turn it off, Brad? <laughs> Wait. 
Yo, I'm sorry. This is bad. Oh, wait, this is forward? And here they come. Thank you. They're going to say, turn on the button. Y'all are showing them how technically inept I am. This is why you should have been the clicker. Is it not working for you either? That makes me feel so much better. It's not working for Jim either. Yeah, that, I get that. <laughs> I hate it when they turn the button on, it works. I know. Why don't you turn it on? You want to wait for the slides, you think? I guess. Well, we don't get to ask questions on that one for now. Yeah, that's fine. That was weird. Oh, what Do y'all just want to flip them back there, Jim? I'm telling you, I curse any kind of technology. Um, okay, I guess we'll just do it this way. So um, this is a very short presentation, and the city manager just kind of outlined everything for y'all. Um, the first quarter really isn't a, a huge indicator of the fiscal year because we don't have a lot of revenues in, but we can you know, kind of begin to get an idea of how the fiscal year is looking. So just keep in mind that everything we're about to show you um, is only most for, mo for the most part one month one, th one month worth of revenues and so things will change dramatically over the next few months next slide please um, and again as the city manager said when we went into the budget the FY 21 budget build the um, state revenues kept being revised over and over again and if y'all remember um, on September 17th at the final budget hearing we elected to only adopt one of the revisions from the state of Florida because we weren't sure what COVID was going to do and we didn't want to keep increasing revenues. So this is kind of um, our gauge to see where we are against that first revision that we adopted in the budget. And hopefully if we continue to um, do better then um, we will meet those second projections. Next slide, please. Um, and then again, due to the seasonal nature of revenues, first quarter revenues, um, will not be in thank you will not be in um, some categories so you're going to see um, a little bit of variations um, this slide is probably really the only um, some of the only numbers we're going to show y'all but the avalorum revenues for the city three first quarter which ends december 31st of 2020 we're at 86 percent of budget and that's very good um, typically we see most of our tax revenues in december January and February, but we are ahead um, in terms of percent of budget received. We are ahead of where we were at this time last year. So that's a very good indicator for the city. And this slide might seem a little odd, but um, our we are comparing first quarter revenues, which go through December. However, in state revenues, we've only received one month. So you're seeing only October revenues. Um, which are booked through December because there's a two month lag in the way we um, get the revenues from the state of Florida. So if you take a look at the 2021 budget, we've basically taken the state revenue budget and just budgeted one month of it to kind of get an indicator of how the state revenues are looking. And you can see we're, we're trending first quarter about 6% of, of, of where we think we would. So that's kind of in line with some of those state revenue projections that we were getting, that we would be above budget a little bit. Um, we are behind last year's actuals, and that's also to be expected because when we budgeted um, the 2021 state revenues, they were budgeted at about a 17% decrease over FY20. So we would expect to see the actuals less than this time last year and we would hope to see that they're more than budget and that's exactly what we're seeing. So that's good things for the city. And with regard to expenditures um, in your packet is the uh, monthly expenditure report that y'all get from um, my department. And we measure all the departments against their bottom line major department budget and everybody is within the benchmark. There are a few um, that are not, and those are due to annual timing payments of debt payments or insurance payments, and the budgets will catch up with those later. But there's no concern on the expenditure side through um, first quarter. In terms of future actions, the city manager said, we're going to continue to um, monitor these state revenues probably more closely this year than we ever have. And at mid-year, we'll do our huge in-depth financial um, update for y'all, and we'll give you an idea of where we project to be at the end of the fiscal year with regard to all of the major revenues sources, including state revenues. 
And that's it. Do y'all have any questions? For real? Yeah. <laughs> Shortest presentation you'll ever get from the finance department. Uh, we always appreciate you. I, I've said it every chance I get. Um, you do a great job, and you do your best to stay out in front of the curve. Uh, and we don't know what the curve is going to look like this year, so that's obviously very concerning, and, and we're going to be on top of that. Um, questions? We can ask questions. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm just making sure. <laughs> uh, anybody? I don't see any now. So you've scared them all off. Yeah. <laughs> Vice Mayor. I just want to know if we can make the budget hearing that short, too. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Yeah. Oh, oh and, and, okay. And, okay, I got you. And we'll continue to monitor. And um, one of the things we were originally projected for this current budget year, state revenues being down 20%, as you recall, came in closer to 14%. Um, some of our coastal cities that rely on bed taxes and things like that are really um, hard hit. So um, we were able to make some adjustments this year, but we just we the uncertainty of what state revenues will, are going to be. Um, we want to stay ahead of it. Does housing values going up in our county and in our city affect us this year? Um, the ad valorem that Bridget showed there yeah. shows that we are tracking uh, Very in, good. in a good way. Um, as I understood it, just to put it out there, it looks like the city of Titusville uh, houses went up an average of 7%. Very solid. I appreciate that. All right, city manager, letters of appreciation. Yes, sir. I'd like to read the letters of appreciation that were received from employees this month uh, from Community Development, Christian Asbury, Tracy Davis, Rosemary Coning, Terry Franklin, Jess Pouncey, and from our fire department, Dana Hersey and Gabriel Tonkins. Very good. We appreciate you guys. Petitions and requests from the public. Oh, Stan. Got a handout. Got them, and you know what to do from here. Name and address. <laughs> All right, are we ready? Yes, sir. All right, here we go. All right, start the clock. Uh, Stan Johnson, 860.7 Avenue, PE. Uh, and I'm a watchdog for uh, Fight for Zero. It's an environmental group. And first of all, I want to say is we looking for the truth. And uh, the first thing I want to mention about the truth is that what you just saw on this comp plan is not truth. Is that what, what you, the comp plan that, that the city has has a foundation of dishonesty, foundation. And so what I, I gave to you is an email, and the first page talks about that, that dishonesty of your foundation. Boy, if I could, I wish I could sue you, but I can't sue you for this dishonesty. But what I've just passed out for you, so going to the next topic. The next topic is the dishonesty that happened on the council meeting that we were here last time January the 12th. Incredible dishonesty by Mr. Stauffer that is revealed by this exhibit that I just gave you. This exhibit. This is, I talked to somebody, one of the council members about this, and so here it is. This is it. This is it. This talks about Mr. Stauffer and his dishonesty, big time. So what this is, is it says, uh, uh, it says it, it's, it's a map that shows where the force main break was, and it shows it says where did the sewage go? Well, the sewage went into that inlet right there. You see that inlet? That, that inlet is described on here. This is signed by me, February the 22nd. Talks about the inlet 19 December the 19th, 20th. I was watching the water going in that inlet, and that water is going in that inlet. It's going downhill. It has to go to the river. It's the only place it can go going downhill. It has to go to the river. So what it's saying here is that, is that it's, when it goes into that inlet, there's no containment. It's going right to the river. 
Mr. Stauffer lied, lied, lied. And then what did he do? He lied some more. He gave you this story about uh, uh, DOT and so forth. He's, he's going to prevent us uh, uh, flooding of Garden Street and US-1 and so forth like that. There's not a bit of truth to that. Not a bit of truth to it. He never contacted the DOT. Nothing about it. In fact, is he doesn't even know where the water was going when he went into that inlet. City of Titusville, this is, this is a copy of their stormwater atlas from years ago. And the city does not know where the water goes once it enters this inlet. But we found out. Where does it go? It goes to Space View Park, where we had the fish killed. That's how we found out. So the secret was, it, it, it exposed his secret that we're, that we're flushing it to Space View Park. That's where we flushed all that. Thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of sewage went to Space View Park. City didn't even know it until they found out they got the fish kill. So Mr. Stauffer's been lying through his teeth. And so, uh, Pins up. Okay, may I have extra time? I think y'all have some anybody? questions about this honesty. Council, any motion? No questions. No motion. Doesn't surprise me. Thanks, Doesn't sir. surprise anybody. No questions about that, that's for sure. Thank you. Anybody else in petitions or requests? Thank you. Nobody else. Council, anything? We will reconvene. Let's reconvene at 10 till. 10 till. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>